Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first anniversary virtual celebration of the ACCA Jamaica chapter. My name is Hugh Reed, Vice Chair of the chapter, and I will be the moderator for this evening's celebration. The primary role of the ACCA Jamaica chapter is to represent ACCA Caribbean in Jamaica. We serve as a local point of contact, advocate for students and members, and act as a vehicle for developing relationships with governments, schools, regulators, other professionals, and the private sector. The ACCA Jamaica chapter was launched July 11, 2019. And while our anniversary celebrations have been delayed by COVID-19, during its first year, the chapter was able to stage various student functions. A joint meeting with the Internal Auditors Association in Jamaica, as well as piloting ACCA sensitization sessions at the Tax Administration of Jamaica's Kingston office, which will serve as a template for other workplace sensitization sessions. COVID-19 has fundamentally changed the way things get done in Jamaica and indeed worldwide. As a result, the ACCA Jamaica chapter will have to re-examine the way it operates as well as build a new foundation and business model if we are to grow in a sustainable way and meet the expectations of our stakeholders. We are therefore pleased and excited to have as our keynote speaker this evening, Dev Ramnarai, author and ACCA USA advocate for 2020. Dev will explore the topic, building a foundation for sustainability leading through crisis, pandemic and beyond. And he will introduce his model for leadership and performance titled The Wheel of Workability, a framework for achieving desired results. At this time, I will now call on Nehanda Nkrumah, Member Advocate Subcommittee Member, to bless our proceedings with a prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks and praise as we celebrate the first anniversary of the ACCA Jamaica chapter. Thank you for all the accomplishments and victories over the past year. We are thankful for all contributed or partnered with us in initiatives over the past year, and we ask your blessings upon them. We acknowledge that we are in unprecedented times, but we thank you for being there for us. Thank you for keeping us focused through the struggles and setbacks, and we look to you for guidance for new challenges ahead of us. We pray that you would continue to give us zeal, wisdom, and vision to serve the various members, affiliates, students, and partners within the chapter. We ask, Lord, for your presence in the celebration and your protection and guidance over Jamaica and our region through these uncertain times. We give you thanks and praise for all these blessings. Amen. Thank you, Nahanda, for that word of prayer. At this time, we're now going to move on with the various remarks, and we will begin with Marlene McIntosh, ACCA International Assembly Representative for Jamaica. And she will bring remarks on behalf of ACCA. Over to you, Marlene. Thank you, Hugh. And warm greetings to you, our members, students, and associates. It is indeed a pleasure to share with you on this, the first anniversary of the local chapter. As your representative at the ACCA International Assembly, it is my responsibility to share your views and concerns with the Assembly at the annual meetings. As the Assembly, we act in an advisory capacity to the ACCA Council as we help the ACCA to think ahead. We play a critical role in the formulation and development of Council strategy. This strategy is driven by feedback received from you, 
our members, students, and associates right across the world. On October 2, we concluded the annual assembly for 2020 under the theme, Reimagining the Accountancy Profession, Purpose and Opportunities in a Post-COVID World. We are aware of various challenges that you face on a daily basis, and we continue to listen to you for any other comments. ACCA continues to think ahead and has put things in place to help you to explore the opportunities that arise in these challenging times. To help you on this path, ACCA has put a number of things in place. And just to name a few, we have free webinars, the COVID-19 hub, mentoring program, and care packages. Also, as a member of the Council of ICAJ, I work closely with Janet Plummer, the chair of this local chapter, and I work also with the ICAJ to help you to explore the available opportunities, which include employment options and examination delivery. We encourage you to remain in contact with the local chapter and explore these opportunities that are available. And please continue to provide your feedback to the ICAJ and this local chapter, and we wish for you a wonderful Chartered Accountants Day. Thank you, Marlene, for those remarks. And we will move on to our next speaker, who is Shelly-Ann Mohammed. She's the head of ACCA Caribbean, and in many respects, she is the boss to whom the ACCA Jamaica chapter reports. Over to you, shelly -Ann. Thank you, Hugh, for that introduction. Good evening and welcome, everyone. On behalf of the ACCA team, I would like to extend congratulations to the local chapter of ACCA members in Jamaica on their one year anniversary. One year may not seem like a very long time in the grand scheme of things, but I remember how many months, weeks, and even years of discussion, planning and trial and error it took for us to get to the point of having a local chapter. That in itself speaks volumes to the incredible significance of this one year milestone. And here we are today. We now have four very active local chapters of the ACCA members in the Caribbean. They are the Barbados chapter, the Cayman Islands chapter, the Bermuda chapter, and of course, the Jamaica chapter with whom we are celebrating this evening. We are also poised to launch chapters in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and St. Lucia before the end of 2020. We are indeed happy and truly grateful for the immense contribution our Jamaica chapter has made toward the success of our regional strategy. As a chapter, you have effectively acted as our eyes and ears on the ground in Jamaica providing us with specific perspectives on the issues you face, as well as emerging local issues. You have contributed to our media publications, represented us at events, acted as our spokespersons and presenters, and the list goes on. You should indeed be very proud, indeed we are of you, at how much has been achieved in this short space of time, particularly in the light of recent challenges as we have all faced Continue and continue to face and as we adapt to a very different way of working within a new and at times very scary normal. Listed among your many accomplishments this year are collaborating with ACC on face-to-face -face PER sessions for future ACC members, presentations to UE Mona in New Tech students, supporting the inaugural Caribbean Public Sector Conference jointly hosted by the ACC the Ministry of Finance and Planning and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica, and chairing the recent launch of the ACCA World Bank Research Report on Sustaining Public Sector Finances. We are proud to say that the local chapters in the region have not only been a success, but provide a huge opportunity for members to play a more active role in the work that we do and give back to future generations of ACCA members through their experience, expertise, and mentorship. Our members are our very lifeblood, upon whom we rely to play a part in ensuring we continue to deliver what the market has come to expect. Excellent leadership. 
We have always worked hard to support our members and future members by continuously innovating and adding value, and have sought to provide additional support through COVID-19 pandemic. Some initiatives have included the launch of the COVID-19 Hub, which is updated weekly, and provides support, information, and resources to students, members, employers, and the business community at large. We have also recently rolled out lifetime membership, which recognizes our retired members and the contrib contribution they have made to the profession over the course of their career. We have fully embraced the digital world and are proud to announce that the Accounting and Business AB magazine have moved entirely online. The new app version is now available for download from Google Play or the App Store and includes a range of engaging content across a variety of formats. Be sure to check it out. In the region, we have actively supported SMEs through the recently concluded Big SME webinar series. We supported our students across the region for example, through over 40 subject matter webinars in collaboration with some of our best tutors and supported members through a vast number of opportunities for CPD and other member welfare initiatives. Colleagues and friends, these are just some of the projects we have been hard at work rolling out over the past few months and many of them would not have been as successful as they would without your input and support. So thank you. I'd like to end once again by congratulating the local chapter of ACCM members in Jamaica. And I take this opening now to present you virtually a token of our appreciation. Your efforts and your passion have not gone unnoticed. Thank you once again. Thank you, Shelian, for those wonderful remarks. And we will now move on to our next speaker, who is Sixto Coy. He is the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica, a major partner for the ACCA Jamaica chapter. And we are now going to have his remarks delivered on behalf of the ICAJ. Over to you, Sixto. Thank you, Chair, ACCA local chapter, Mrs. Janet Plummer, other members of ACCA Jamaica. On behalf of the Council of the Institute of Charter Accountants of Jamaica, I extend congratulations to the local chapter of ACC on your first anniversary. ICAJ and ACC are long-standing partners in, a, in advancing the accountancy profession in Jamaica. The Institute therefore welcomes the involvement of this chapter in helping to preserve the principles of the profession. This one-year anniversary comes at a time of uncertainty due to COVID-19. Pandemic-related restrictions have severely affected the way business operate. The compounding impact on households and the nation has been staggering. It is commendable that you are using today's celebration not solely for accolades, but to have an important discussion on how accountants can contribute to building a foundation for sustainability in Jamaica. Since the pandemic, there's been a surge in e-commerce. While many companies move their operations online, others are not so flexible. Discussions around the sustainability of this new norm should involve the type of industry or business, where the products or services are consumed, how payments are received, and statutory obligations determined, among other factors. While several opportunities have surfaced for new and emerging businesses, we should also consider if they will be needed post-pandemic. What elements can survive and how does the entity plan for it? As companies adjust and look for new and sustainable business models in response to COVID-19, this evening's exercise organized by the ACC local chapter is a step in the right direction. In closing, I wish for you an evening of fruitful discussion and look forward to the outcome. Happy anniversary. Thanks, Sixto, for those remarks. And we will now move on to our next presenter, who is one of our hardworking subcommittee chairmen, or should I say chairpersons, and that is Cheryl Daly. And Cheryl is the head of the Student Advocate Subcommittee. And she's now going to bring remarks on behalf of that subcommittee. Over to you, Cheryl. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am honored to be an executive member of the local chapter in the capacity of student advocate. Along with myself as team lead and Janet as chairman, I have been fortunate to have as part of the student advocates committee, Hugh Reed, Andrew Thomas, and Angela Curtis. This inaugural year has uncovered or highlighted a few student-related challenges that we're committed to trying to tackle, namely recruitment, student progression, student retention, and affiliate conversion. The issues with student recruitment include insufficient sensitization around the value and the benefits of the ACC qualification, insufficient engagement with business and accounting students at high schools and universities, and that employers outside the big four firms tend to recruit on demand. The student progression issues include students' lack of exam and time management techniques leading to low pass rates, lack of quality tuition, students not entering for or sitting exams in a timely manner, and lack of support from employers. With regard to student retention, we are aware of students' inability to pay annual subscriptions, and students not progressing and suffering deregistration. Affiliate conversion is played by the fact that we have approximately 100 long-term affiliates in Jamaica. As time passes after exams and affiliates do not convert. In some cases, the practical supervisor is not IFA qualified, so there are delays in signing off the PER. Also, there are employers who do not generally want to recognize or remunerate new members. And finally, some affiliates are either unemployed or not working in a relevant role. These challenges have defined the way for us at the local chapter. But we are fortunate to have the support and guidance of ACCA Caribbean in attempting to remedy the issues identified. The chapter has embarked on consultations with our stakeholders, for example, forming a WhatsApp group for the chapter, which is part of the reason we asked for the pertinent information when persons were registering for this session. Also, the formulation and dissemination of a utility document to students and employees, and attendance and participation at high school and universities, career day and exhibition fairs. We look forward to continually serving and meeting the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for those remarks. And we are indebted to the great job that you have been doing as chair for the Student Advocate Subcommittee. And we will now move on to our next speaker, who is Janet Plummer, chair, founding chair for the ACCA Jamaica chapter. Janet is an accomplished chartered accountant and in fact sits on the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Jamaica's council. And we're happy to have her leading the ACCA Jamaica chapter. So we're gonna ask Janet to bring remarks on behalf of the chapter and over to you, Janet. Oh, thank you, Hugh, for that introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to see that so many of you participating in today's event. I know you had numerous choices, especially today, as we celebrate Chartered Accountants Day in Jamaica. I hope the Chartered Accountants in the room were given a treat by their employers. If you weren't, rest assured, 
that this chapter will be working to ensure that all our employers, business associates, as well as the public begin to recognize the worth of the chartered accountant, especially in the areas of accountability and corporate governance. The work the chapter plans to do will be well supported by ACCA International and ACCA Caribbean. Since we're in Jamaica, whatever we do must be with the blessings and in alignment with the objectives of ICAG. As a member of council, I mm -hmm. hold the enviable position of serving as a bridge between the two organizations. Our target audience is the same, but we are not in competition to outdo or outperform each other. We are working together to encourage students to choose accountancy as a profession and to ensure that those of you who have already taken that step are provided with the required information and support to enable you to be successful in your chosen careers. I started out by saying thanks for joining us for this event today. And since I'm standing between you and the feast that Dev has prepared for you, I close by encouraging you to place all your comments and whatever questions you may have about the chapter and how it can help you in the chat. We also encourage you to let us know what specifically you need assistance with. Now, don't be shy, don't hold anything back. Write exactly what you need help with. While all of these groups that you heard today are here to lend support, our efforts would be futile without your participation. I hope you are encouraged and excited about what you have heard so far. And I look forward to hearing more from you to enable us to serve you better and cater to your needs. Have an enjoyable evening and happy Chartered Accountants Day. Thank you, Janet, for those remarks. And we are very, very happy to have you as our leader. And we expect under your leadership to grow from strength to strength. At this time, we now have our keynote speaker, Dev Ramnarain, author and ACCA USA advocate for 2020. We are indeed specially blessed to have Dev speak to us at this seminar and his topic, building a foundation for sustainability, leading through crisis, pandemic, and beyond. This is a topic for our time as we face the deadly COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm now going to ask Dev to come forward and present his topic at this time. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here today at the ACCA chapter event for this anniversary. I want to say a special thank you to Janet and to Hugh and the ACCA Caribbean team for all of the hard work that they've put in to make this event a success. I know that we have all been dealing with, you know, this challenge globally around COVID-19. And I think that makes this a perfect time to have the conversation that we're about to have leading through crisis, the pandemic and beyond. So a little about me before I dive in, I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I currently live in Miami, Florida, and I have been an ACCA member for over 15 years. Um, I'm a partner at CPA by Choice, a middle market, audit, accountant, and consultant firm. I'm also a co-founder of Thrudheim LLC, which is a blockchain advisory uh, company where we advise companies on the adoption of blockchain technology. And I also love education. So I have opportunities where I get to educate accountants about blockchain and interacting with blockchain. I'm also the executive vice president for the National Association of Black Accountants here in Miami. And I recently also founded an education company, Dave Ramnarine Education, which focuses on offering a CCA online tuition and 
we are offering the world's only online exclusive platinum solution provider for ACCA. And if you want to know more about that offering, you can visit www.dreducation.io. Um, I'm also passionate about performance and leadership, which is what had me be here today as I am getting ready to publish my book later on this year about a model that I created. And I'm excited to share part of that book with you today and how this would apply to leading from the pandemic and beyond. This is a, a slide just showing, you know, the topics that we'll go through. Uh, so, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to dive right in. So now, when I talk about a world that works, what do I mean? I, you know, so today I want to talk about this with you. I've been doing some work around leadership, as I mentioned, for many years and personal performance and just winning the game called life. and. This talk is an overview of the materials, as I mentioned, um, that I have in that upcoming book. Now, since I was a young person, uh, since I was a young man, I had a singular vision, which was to create a world that works. And by that, I mean a world where people, families and teams and communities are all effective in whatever they are set out to do, the games that they set out to play, and where the environment that they're in supports that effectiveness. Now, another way to say this is that I want a world of workability. And workability is defined as being capable of being put into effective operation. I want a world that has effective operation for everyone in every situation. I want a world where people are inspired, empowered, and have clarity for taking actions that are effective in fulfilling what is important to them. I want the world, a world where people are known, they're seen, and they're understood, and that people know that they matter. So for this vision to come to life, we all have to transform our relationship to ourselves and others. For us to be able to lead through this pandemic, you know, the world after the pandemic, we have to transform some things over where we are at. Currently, there's a lot of unworkability in the world, in our lives, and especially with the impact of COVID-19. You know, when we talk about unworkability, I, I have a few examples from growing up. I remember I was a child playing in my house back in Trinidad and, you know, running around discovering all the nooks and crannies of the house. And I decided to stick a butter knife into the electrical outlet to clean the bugs that had died and needed to say I got electrocuted. I found out never to do that again. And, you know, my, had my parents simply done what worked, which is to get the plastic cover and put it on that electrical outlet, I would not have had that experience happen. You know, when I was a teenager growing up on a farm in Trinidad, my dad was spraying pesticides on the farm and we weren't given proper, you know, masks and stuff to wear. I ended up with chemical poisoning and lost my hair, which never grew back. Um, now, the, the impacts of unworkability or these negative events goes far beyond the short-term physical impact of pain or even hair loss. They created in me a sense of fear, uncertainty, anxiety, you know, some form of paralysis around certain actions. My objective to explore the home had become thwarted. And my, you know, I wanted to feel the safety of my home and getting electrocuted was not an experience that would have lent to that objective, you know? My, my appetite for adventure was reduced. Now, unworkability creates a condition that constrains us and thwarts us. A world that works is a world where people are free to pursue their objectives unthwarted. Now, in part, 
it's because of these early encounters with unworkability in my life that I decided to dedicate my life to creating workability everywhere I go. It's why I became an accountant and auditor. Our jobs as accountant and auditor is to verify that things work as they are designed, that proper governance is defined and being adhered to. When we do our jobs, the world is a better place. People and processes are effective and integrous. Over the years in my capacity as an auditor, I've had the opportunity to work with numerous organizations, numerous individuals, people from different backgrounds. And it's in that experience that I began to see that there were certain themes of workability that kept coming up over and over. And when addressed, they led to marked improvement in the effectiveness um, of you know, individuals and teams. I further understood that when simple, easy to understand aspects of workability are practiced in daily life, people not only emerge as more effective, and productive, but they naturally begin to emerge as leaders. Now, when we speak about leadership, especially during crisis, we most times we, we, we're programmed to look outward for that leadership. We are automatically looking towards someone else, the boss, your parents, the community, and you know, others that you look up to. This automatic mode most times have to do with how we have been programmed to look at leadership. And usually this programming comes from school, it comes from, you know, different locations, like, you know, family hangouts or whatever, like you've been molded and created into thinking about leadership in a particular way. Now, the idea that leadership can naturally emerge from anyone, anytime, may be counterintuitive. We are programmed by society to believe that leadership or leaders are highly accomplished um, individuals and that the term leader is reserved for very important people. You know, even the, the dictionary definition of a leader is a person who leads or commands a group, organization, or country. This definition of leadership is very limiting, for it implies that leadership is reserved for only a few. It may even make you think that you are not a leader, or you're not powerful enough, or simply enough to be a leader. We, you know, have been taught that leadership is something that we eventually get to at some point in the future. It's always sometimes just out of reach. We, we look up to those people upon by society to be leaders. And we typically say, well, one day I'll get to be like that particular person. Now, having this idea of leadership as a place you get to one day strips us all of experiencing ourselves as leaders right now. And this is what I call a get to phenomenon, right? Like one day you'll get to that point. Now, if we look at the actions of someone we look up to as a leader, a boss or a CEO, for example, they aren't, the actions they take, they aren't very much different from the actions that you or I would take. We're both, you know, CEO, junior accountant. We're both declaring outcomes for the future. We're designing tactical plans to fulfill on those um, particular action items. We go and we have conversation with coworkers. We follow up with them. We make requests of things. Now, we give feedback as well. And the CEO would do that same thing. I would do that same thing. And you would do that same thing if it is that you are a junior accountant or a junior auditor, for example. The scale of impact of those actions may be different. You know, the number of people affected, the amount of money impacted, but the quality of those tasks themselves 
is very much the same. Both the junior auditor and the CEO, for example, are creating workability in their respective environment, the foundation of leadership. Today, with the impact of COVID-19, we have a unique opportunity to discover leading, for example, from our homes or with our families or seeking or being able to do so intentionally as you know, the environments keep changing around us. Now, if we give up the common misconception that leadership is a destination, that it is a place to get to one day, we can begin to put on another lens and start seeing ourselves as leaders right now. Consider that leadership is a place to come from. It's not a place to get to. Leadership is not something you do. It's something you be. It is a choice, a way of being and acting that you get to declare for yourself. It doesn't require anyone externally to anoint you a leader. You are the authority who declares yourself a leader. And when you are consistently being a leader by choice, the quality of your life begins to transform. You get to be a leader in your home, your workplace, your community, because you choose to come from that space of leadership rather than kicking the can down the road and thinking that leadership would come later at some point in time. Be a leader right now, right here, because you say so, and interact with yourself and everyone you meet from that context. Mm -hmm. Now, before we dive into uh, you know, the, the model I spoke about for my book, I wanna just pause and have a conversation about good habits and creating habits. Now, a new habit could get developed in some cases in as little as 18 days. We are currently still dealing with, you know, the impact of COVID-19 in many cases, still working from home, for example. Now, when you, when you get in your car, if I were to give an example of how habits get created, you automatically put on your seatbelt. You don't think about it. You don't, you know, go through that thought process about why you have to do it. You just do it because, you know, it's become a habit. Your brain likes habits because they're efficient. And when you automate common actions, you free up mental resources for other tasks. I have seen a lot on social media, and you might have your version of this, persistent complaints about being at home or the kids or the neighbors, persistent complaints about you know, sharing space, wanting to leave and hide. You know, I, I know we may all experience our own version of this. And on the flip side, I've also seen people talking about new ways that they're excited about discovering to interact or to communicate or what they've been reading or, or, or the fact that they've been taking on some development personally and professionally. The point here is that what I wanna leave you with here about habits is to be intentional and watchful. Be on the lookout for habits that creep up on us that may not serve our larger commitments. For example, I know I love to cook and eat and I've been you know, eating way more than I should during this uh, lockdown period. Now, I hope that as we go through the model, you would see ways to become more intentional in creating habits and even being able to identify habits that you might have unintentionally um, adopted over the last six months that you may now need to work on, you know, creating new habits to get rid of the old ones or the ones that aren't serving us achieving our goals and objectives. So let's talk about master and workability because this would be the key to leading, you know, from the pandemic and beyond, leading through crisis. And in order to make workability easy to understand, like I mentioned, I created a model and I call it the wheel of workability. 
So leading through crisis and beyond may occur as difficult sometimes. Uh, my model gives a framework to empower, inspire, and leave you with clarity to discover leading at any point, anywhere. At the center of this wheel, the hub is integrity. The outer part of the wheel is accountability. The five spokes are responsibility, rules of engagement, communication, acknowledgement, and play. Underneath the wheel are, those, uh, are two obstacles to workability, attachment and concerns. Today, we'll not get into significant details about all the elements of the wheel. I will touch on a few aspects and you know, follow me on LinkedIn uh, for other webinars where I would do a deeper dive into the wheel of workability and also well make posts about the publishing of my book. So the first part we want to talk about is integrity. At the center of the wheel, you know, is it's there for a reason, right? Now, when we hear the word integrity, we often think of the moral definition of integrity, right? The quality of being morally upright or the ACCA definition, you know, be straightforward and honest in all professional and business relationship. The ACCA rule book, you know, goes on to state that integrity implies not merely honesty, but fair dealing and truthfulness. But this isn't the definition relevant for our discussion. There is another definition of integrity, which is the state of being whole and undivided, the condition of being unified, unimpaired, or sound in construction, internally consistent. Integrity sits at the center of the wheel because it has a special place of importance as the bedrock of all other practices. Let's take, for example, uh, you know, a bicycle wheel. In a mechanical sense, the spokes and the circumference all depend upon the structural integrity of the hub. If you lose a spoke in your wheel, it will automatically place more pressure on the other spokes and it's not ideal as it can damage the wheel all entirely. If you have a flat, you can technically continue riding your bike. However, you will now run a very high risk of damaging the wheel in a manner that you will not be able to use it thereafter. If the hub goes out, the path on which everything else revolves, the wheel simply cannot work. What is critical to note here is that for a wheel to have workability, all parts must function as designed. Look at the definition of integrity again, being whole, undivided, unified, consistent. When we operate without integrity, our life lacks workability. Have you ever noticed how contradictory sometimes we could be? One minute I could say, I wanna lose weight. And then the next I could say, I wanna eat a cookie. You know, uh, this, is, this is a lack of internal consistency. You know, in the, in, it's an internal state of being divided. You are literally of two minds. I want to be a high performer at work, runs into it's Friday and I wanna leave early. In our personal life, you know, we could tell our spouse that we wanna be faithful and then we go have an affair. We tell our children, we'll take them to the beach, but then Saturday morning comes and we're too tired. A lack of consistency or unity causes big problems in our lives. It means people can't rely on us. They can't count on us. We're unreliable. Others don't know if we can be trusted to do what we say we're gonna do. This means other people have to accommodate our unworkability which makes their lives more difficult. So if you want a life that works, practice being consistent. Practice recognizing when you have a thought or desire that's inconsistent or contradicting the game that you say you're playing. You know, don't undermine yourself or others. As you begin to understand 
the other practices of workability, we got to be consistent in applying them. Now, as it relates to leadership and leading through crisis, integrity is important for a few reasons. First, as a leader, you know, a leader is someone who others can depend upon and know that they can depend upon them. You know, that is only possible when a leader has integrity. Second, a leader is clear about the games they're playing and they play it without being driven by internal contradictions or doubts. Finally, a leader must be consistent in the application and practices of workability in order to be high performing overall. A leader is not someone who can be effective three out of seven days a week or only when motivated to do so. You know, it's like if you're leading from through crisis or from this pandemic and beyond, you can't choose, well, I'll do this three days next week and, you know, maybe I'll think about doing it the following week. You got to be consistent seven days a week. Now, accountability, another item on my wheel. Accountability is a complement to integrity. If part of integrity is doing what you say you will do, then accountability is both the promises you make and the holding of yourself to account for those promises being fulfilled. When you are accountable, you are the one who ensures something gets done, even if you're not the person actually doing it. When, when you take accountability for an area of your life, you are taking ownership of it. And think about when we talk about leading through crisis, right? Put up the areas of your life that you're, that you're looking at and think about it from this particular lens. When you take accountability for that area of your life, you are taking ownership of it. When you take accountability for your future, like leading beyond the pandemic, you are taking ownership of your future. When we don't take accountability, we give up the outcome of our life to chance or to happenstance or to other people. Personal productivity guru Warner Ehad had this to say about accountability. Accountability is the opportunity to live a choice rather than accidentally. Accountability is the opportunity to carve out a future rather than sit back and have it happen to you. By carving out the future, we mean that when you take accountability, you are defining the outcome of your life. You are saying that something will exist in your life or that the world in a certain period of time and you go make that happen. I'm taking accountability for ending, let's say, hunger in my community. That's a declaration of an accountability that, should you take it on, would have your life look very different than it looks right now. Now, too often we see accountability as a burden and we end up fulfilling on accountabilities that are assigned to us. You need a job, so you get one. You, you know, and inside your job, you are assigned to be accountable for certain things. But when you take on accountability as your own, when you declare yourself accountable for some aspect of your personal or professional life, you take ownership of that aspect and it becomes yours. This puts you in a position of power rather than being a victim to circumstances. What's interesting about accountability is you can be accountable for anything, for things that are bigger than just your everyday set of responsibility. You can declare yourself that you are accountable for the success of your organization or even for your client's organization. And you can choose to relate to your daily job as being, you know, at home through COVID-19 from a position of accountability. Can you see how someone who shows up to work 
merely to fulfill responsibility would perform quite differently than someone who shows up and considers themselves accountable for the future of the enterprise. Accountability gives your life a purpose and makes it meaningful. And it sets in motion an adventure that we wouldn't otherwise experience. And this is what leaders do. Leaders create a life that's bigger than what they were assigned. It's a kind of uh, magical um, quality that, you know, makes things. Now, responsibility is the first spoke in the wheel. In the usual understanding of responsibility, it is defined as, you know, a state of fact of having a duty to deal with something or of having to con control or having control over someone. It's tactical. You have certain duties you are tasked with, you know, from, you know, from taking out the trash to writing a report for your client. Um, and you know, your, your life has workability when you are aware of those tasks and you perform them successfully. Integrity and responsibility are complements. When you are a person of integrity, you fulfill on your promises. You know, when you make a promise, you are creating a responsibility for yourself. You are responsible for doing something or producing some result. And, you know, whatever you do then follows that. If it is that you're not consistent, then it shows up, right? People question your integrity. Now, your life will simply be more effective if you do the things you say you would do. But there's a limitation to this definition of responsibility. Having a duty to deal with something, I mean, who wants to deal with something? Usually when we say deal with something, it's a bad thing. Too often responsibilities show up in life as a burden or problem, things we have to do. You know, I have to take out the trash or I have to write this report by five o'clock. This makes our lives feel heavy and dull. What if instead of I have to, we say that I get to, you know, a shift in context, like I get to take out the trash or I get to visit my mother in the nursing home. I get to write that report. You know, the simple shift in perspective can create a positive relationship to tasks and turn them into opportunities rather than burdens. Another technique to shift how responsibility occurs to you is to see them inside of your personal accountability. Accountability creates the context of purpose for your life, which in turn makes mundane tasks more meaningful. Let's say you're walking down the street and you see a piece of litter. If, if you don't have a sense of accountability, you might just ignore it or judge the person who put it there. You know, the litter is a burden. Let's say you've created yourself as accountable for saving the planet. When you see that litter, you would naturally pick it up and put it in the trash because who you are is accountable for the well-being of the planet. And when you declare yourself accountable, it's a choice. So responsibilities, aren't have to assignment from outside. They are manifestation of the choice you made to be accountable. Again, it's not, I have to pick up the litter. It's I get to pick up the litter as an opportunity to fulfill on my accountability to the planet. Now there's a second more philosophical approach to thinking about responsibility that goes beyond just tasks. In the same way that we've talked about leadership as being a state of being rather than a thing you do, an accountability as a state of mind or context for giving your life meaning, responsibility can also be seen as a context or place to come from that empowers you to be more effective in your life. If accountability is about owning your future, Responsibility is about owning your present. 
when you are responsible, you create workability by taking ownership of everything you do and everyone and everything that's around you, even if when things are happening to you that are unpleasant or beyond your control. When you say you are responsible for whatever is happening, you put yourself in the driver's seat, you know, which empowers you to take effective action no matter what. Declaring yourself responsible takes on pleasant scenarios and turn them into opportunities to express being powerful. We see good leaders take responsibility for things that their employees do. You know, if a junior accountant ordered to create a PR nightmare, you'd see the CEO stand up and take full responsibility, even though it wasn't directly their fault. Being responsible isn't about what's fair or just, it's about creating a context for adverse events that gives you power to make them right. Even if you have good reasons or justifications, being a victim leaves you feeling helpless and powerless to take effective action. There's no possibility to create workability. So during this pandemic, you know, getting out of this pandemic and leading beyond it, we're left with the question, how can I take 100% responsibility? One of the questions I want to leave you with here is, Look at an area of life right now that might not be working as a result of this pandemic or this crisis. If you were to take on 100% responsibility, what would that area of life actually look? What would be possible? What opening for actions might get created that might not have been created before? Now, I'll, I'll briefly touch on other elements of the wheel here in the interest of saving time. So the next book we call is The Rules of Engagement. And I talk about explicit and implicit rules here. The whole point here is to be aware of the rules of engagement. And we could get into this a lot more, reach out to me on LinkedIn, and I could share more about this if you have questions about this. Communication, the third spoke on the wheel. You know, it's not simply about public speaking or being a good uh, speaker. It's about being in communication, not avoiding communication. And also listening, listening from a space of no judgment. Typically, when we start listening to people, we already have a judgment or assessment about what they're gonna say. Even in speaking, when the moment I started, you probably had a running commentary going on in your brain, which is like, well, where's his accent from? Um, you might have something like, oh, I remember seeing him doing another webinar somewhere. Now, your mind is actually in its own conversation and you're not actually listening to what's being said. So inside of being in communication or this aspect of the wheel of workability, we talk about being in communication and also listening from a space where there's no judgment, no assessment, no opinion, actually being there to actually get the communication. Now, what I want to leave you with here is, in, during the current pandemic, I want to leave you with this question about communication, where you might have gotten into an argument or communication or a conversation didn't go the way you wanted it to go. If you were listening from a space of no judgment, no opinion, no assessment, and really giving the other person the space to be heard, what might have been possible? What would have been a possible different outcome in that conversation. And then acknowledgement. When we talk about acknowledgement here, it's not just about acknowledging the truth of something, like acknowledging that something exists. It's also, I'm talking about the dual aspect of acknowledgement. Yes, we could acknowledge things that exist and also use it as a way of displaying gratitude. Now, acknowledgement, what I see with, with good leaders is that they're able to do both. Acknowledge the truth and existence of something and at the same time, acknowledge a job well done, right? And it's something that when you're fully acknowledged, it empowers you, you feel inspired, you go beyond, right, in your performance. And then 
Finally here, the last spoke in the wheel is play. And what I mean by that is a lot of time we are fixated on how things should look, how they should be. And bringing in play is where we get to bring in a little bit of ambiguity to consider other points of view. And usually this works very well in a boardroom, especially where you have different viewpoints, different people trying to get different things done, being open to listen to other viewpoints. And one of the things that I say here is that when you bring play into a conversation, you know, you get to communicate as though you're right. And what the moment someone else is making their point, you get to listen as though you might be wrong, right? So you bring that level of play and ambiguity to conversations. And I promise you, you'll be surprised results you can produce and the kind of options that might become available when you talk about leading through crisis or leading through a pandemic into the future, it makes for magical conversations. Now, last but not least here, inside of my model, I talk about concerns and attachment, the things that get in the way of us being able to lead through this pandemic. When we hear about concerns, you know, we, we think about like, are we doing it right? Uh, would, would I get criticized? Would somebody laugh at me? You know, what if the point I make is not valid? What if it potentially goes wrong? You know, we have a world of concerns and concerns typically stop us from being in action. We might want to lead through this pandemic. We might want to be able to go into the future and lead, but all of these concerns, when they come in, they prevent us from taking action. Now, concerns, we are trained biologically to freeze when there's a threat. You know, so when we have a concern, we stop being playful for fear of being silly, or we stop speaking truth for fear of being fired. We stop acknowledging someone for fear of being weird. You know, we stop following the rules of engagement for fear of failing. But the thing is, concerns are not real. They are just one interpretation of reality and they usually just reside up here. You know, when I talk about attachment, in Buddhism, the second noble truth is the root of all suffering is attachment. And I, I believe this very much. You know, you are attached to uh, how you think something is supposed to look. When we, when we are attached, we, you know, sorry about that, um, we end up getting fixated onto the way that things should look. You are also fixated on, you know, how it is your job look, how a relationship is supposed to look. And, you know, we, we become sort of in a box because life is supposed to look a specific way. Now, the antidote for both concerns and attachment is play. Play gets dismissed as insignificant because, oh, we're grown up and we need to be serious about things, but it's actually one of the single most powerful techniques for overcoming fear and paralysis. Learn to recognize when you are feeling attached to an outcome as, you know, and, and get, you know, like getting that one job or getting that one relationship or marrying that specific person, living in that one city. You know, the world is full of possibility. If it is, we are open to it. Now, in addition to the magic of playfulness as an antidote for concerns and attachment, there's a bigger possibility to consider. In our metaphor of the wheel, note that the wheel is going through the mud and the stone or whatever. And what it is that make a monster wheel powerful, for example, they have big tires, which means the bigger the tire, the more mud the truck can maneuver through. Remember that the size of the wheel of workability is based on accountability. When you expand your accountability, you expand the size of the wheel. The bigger the wheel, the less significant are the concerns and attachment. And literally, when, when you create large accountability for yourself, these attachment and concern become smaller and smaller. They're still there. But because you have a bigger life, it's like literally you have 
better things to do with your time than worry about concerns and attachment. Now, Parkinson's law state that work expands to fill the time allotted. So when you don't have any big games you are playing, tiny problems occupy big spaces because your time isn't being accounted for. But when, like I was saying, you have larger accountability that demands more of you and your time, problems naturally shrink to fit the time that's allotted to them. Now, leadership is ontological. Ontology is, you know, the study, the metaphysics of being. And what I'm pointing out on this slide here, it's not about what you do, it's about who you be. Ontology is a branch of metaphysics that deal with the nature of being. And more than anything, I'd like you to consider that creating a world of workability, having a life of workability, you, uh, when you're being high performance and discovering your leadership, it's not about what you choose to do, it's about or who to be. Leaders radiate that kind of energy. And it's, you know, a certain kind of being. And even in the face of failure or setback, they have the power to stand tall and continue to push ahead. As you can see on the slide, being a leader, being accountable, being responsible, it's all states of being rather than saying, I got to do something. Again, it's not what you do, it's who you be. No one gets to tell you who you be, even when you don't have control of what you do. It's purely a matter of what makes, you know, what you make of the moment and discovering and mastering who you be moment by moment will transform the quality of your life in ways that you can't imagine. So when we talk about leading through crisis, pandemic and beyond, Look at who you're being about leadership. Are you being in communication? Are you being someone that follows the rules of engagement? Get into that realm and I promise you, it will be magical. I wanna say thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. And I welcome questions. Any questions that don't get answered on you know, this forum, feel free to, again to send it to me on LinkedIn and I'll be more than happy to answer those. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Dev, for that illuminating and very informative presentation. And I'm sure we will have a number of questions that you will have to take based on the information you shared. So at this time, we're going to be moving into our question and answer segment. But before I do that, there are some important persons who I'd like to recognize who are on this webinar. And I'd like to especially recognize Carol Ann Booth. She is the USA ACCA council member and one of us, a Jamaican, and she's on this video conference, as is David McGann who is from Ireland and an ACCA advocate. It is going to be a difficult challenge for us. We have a lot of questions and it is clear that we will not be able to answer all the questions online. But rest assured that if you ask the question that you will in fact get a response. But we are going to select a couple of the questions and I use couple in the Jamaican context, not in the UK context. Couple in Jamaican parlance means any number. So we're going to take a, a number of these questions and we will start with questions that were addressed to Cheryl Daly, who is the student advocate subcommittee chair. The first question was, as a student, who has not yet attained ACCA membership, how would this group, the ACCA Jamaica chapter, be beneficial to me? So Cheryl will now respond. Thank you for that question, Hugh. 
Belonging to this group can be quite beneficial. For example, attendance at webinars, either locally or virtually, through ACCA Caribbean, will build your knowledge base, resulting in invaluable personal and professional development whilst pursuing or completing the requisite 36 months qualifying work experience towards membership. In fact, last year, the chapter, in collaboration with ACCA Caribbean, hosted an affiliate session with ICAJ, where I delivered a presentation on affiliates' completion and their PER and applying for ACCA membership. Additionally, you will be able to participate in our satisfaction and our surveys, and the information gathered from these will help to improve the service and support that we give to you and our affiliates. Also, you will be part of the pool of affiliates that our chapter can choose from for articles and features. And lastly, the group will match mentors to those who need them. I hope this makes you excited to join us. Thanks, Cheryl, for that very comprehensive response. And our next question is, is there any information regarding study materials? Are there any costs associated with joining this ACCA Jamaica chapter? So over to you again, Cheryl, for your response. These are two good questions. ACCA Caribbean has hosted student webinar series for those who are sitting exams. In fact, in February this year, I participated in the series held. This series covered topics such as audit and assurance, strategic business leader, financial reporting, financial management, and advanced audit and assurance. Additionally, I would always recommend the ACCA website for materials. Furthermore, the chapter will also send out messages about study schools and training as they become available. And now to the second part of your question. There are no costs associated with joining the chapter. We welcome all students, affiliates, members to join, as we believe there is a part that all persons can play. Also, efforts will be made to offer training and webinars free of cost, as we build foundation for sustainability. Thank you. Thanks again, Cheryl, for that response. And based on your response, I'm expecting all the members, all the students who are on this call to be joining the ACC Jamaica chapter because it's free and you will be getting a lot of value in return. We have other questions and these are now questions directed at Janet Plummer, who is again, let me remind you, the chair for the ACC Jamaica chapter. And she has a triple barreled question. And the question is this, when was the ACCA Jamaica chapter launched? What is a chapter about? And finally, what is the main objective of the Jamaica chapter? Over to you, Janet. Thank you very much for those questions, Hugh. As a reminder, and for the benefits of those persons who may have missed Hugh's opening remarks, let me just say that the chapter was launched on July 8, 2019 at the Courtley Hotel in New Kingston. The main objective of the local chapter is to play a vital role in representing ACCA Caribbean in the local territory. It serves as a local point of contact, an advocate for future students and members, and also act as a vehicle for developing relationships with government representatives, schools, regulators, and other professionals. So while there are other things that the chapter will do, like you would have heard in Cheryl's presentation and even from other members 
of the presented of the board, the persons who presented today. That is the main objective of the local chapter. Thank you for that response, Janet. And you have another question. The question is, seeing that I don't want to be added to the WhatsApp group for the ACCA Jamaica chapter, are there any other ways that I could keep in touch with the chapter? Your response, Janet. Thank you very much, Hugh, for that question. I know that quite a number of persons are concerned about joining WhatsApp groups because oftentimes, if they're not managed properly, they can be a real heartache. And while we want to promise that our group will not be run in that manner, we understand the concern that persons have. So those of you who are interested in the chapter activities, but do not want to be added to the WhatsApp group, can keep in touch with us by following the ACCA Caribbean social media pages, especially the ones on LinkedIn. In addition, you will also be able to communicate with us using the email account and we will send the email address to you. And if you want to send us a voice message or a telephone call, we will also provide a telephone number for you to get in touch with us directly. Otherwise, ACCA Caribbean will be sending email messages to persons whenever activities are coming up or any events are being planned. Anything that you want to be notified about will come to you through the ACCA Caribbean's email. However, if you would like to get in touch with us directly, you can send us an email message or send us a phone call or a text message which will, to numbers and address that will be provided to you. Thanks for that response, Janet. And ladies and gentlemen, it is very clear the ACCA Jamaica chapter is very accessible and we stand ready to respond as quickly as possible to your questions and comments. The final question for Janet is somewhat of a comment rather than a question. And it is that there is someone who would like to volunteer in respect of the ACCA Jamaica chapter, and they want to know how this can be done. I know that this is a question that Janet is looking forward to, and she's anxious to respond. So over to you, Janet. Oh, this question is a godsend. It's not a question, it's really a comment. Somebody wants to know how they can volunteer in any way possible. Thank you very much for offering. Currently, the chapter comprises the executive, which the persons you would have heard before, and we also have three other members assisting with membership and student affairs. But in order to adequately serve the community of members, students and affiliates, we definitely need more hands on deck. We encourage you to send us an email at accajamaicachapter at gmail.com or a WhatsApp message at 876-325-5383. This will be put in the chat for future reference and it will also be on the closing slide. Remember that this is a group of volunteers. So there will be no compensation, no financial compensation to the persons who choose to help. But we really appreciate the offer. Thank you very much. And we look forward and hope that a number of you on the call today will volunteer to assist us to get our programs going. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Janet, for the responses to the questions. And we'll now move on to the questions that we have selected that relates to the address by Dev Ram Narayan. And the first question for Dev is, how do I make someone else accountable in the workplace? Okay. Over to you, Dev. Well, that's a good question. So, you know, making someone accountable. Well, first of all, I think that's where we have a big problem in the workplace. And even at home, when we try to make people accountable, creating accountability is, is a very subtle thing. You don't force someone to be accountable. 
it's it's an art of having a conversation where someone gets to declare themselves accountable otherwise it's just like you know creating people that just do what you say they're going to do and basically mindlessly follow your interactions or your instructions without discovering themselves as accountable right so i think that's a broader conversation to have you can't make someone accountable you have to have them discover what accountability looks like from where they are and i think that's where the challenge is in the workplace because we're always so you know focused on like oh the job needs to get done we don't realize that if you know to have someone function in a very powerful manner accountability is where the magic is at and it requires conversation it requires being willing to have that person discover what it looks like to be accountable i hope that answered that question um and like i say you know feel free to send me follow ups on linkedin thanks for that response dev that was a difficult question and i believe your response your answer identify the key elements in terms of the question that was posed the the second question for you is how can i get rid of assessing or judging a conversation over to you dev so i don't think we'll ever get rid of assessing and judging conversations um because it's automatic it's the way we're designed it's our you know survival brain like the only time you get rid of that is when you die and you're not thinking about things right so it's just automatic for us to assess what someone is saying have an opinion about it judge it or like start formulating what you're going to say to respond to someone and not really being with them in that conversation so you like i haven't gotten rid of it however what i've done is to become more aware and self aware of that voice that wants to have that running commentary and be able to set it aside and be able to set it aside and that practice you know takes time and you know now that we're actually having this conversation and you go out there in the world and you start interacting at home or at the workplace listen to how you have an assessment running and notice that you could stop yourself and put it aside so you could be in that conversation so you're not going to get rid of it you're going to become present it and realize that you got to put it aside so you could actually be in that conversation okay thank you again dev for that response i really must commend those persons who have posed questions to dev the questions are deep and they require serious thought in response the final question for Dev is, I work very hard and sometimes I feel like I don't get the acknowledgement that I deserve. It leaves me feeling unfulfilled and sometimes frustrated. In your model, you talk about acknowledgement. What can I do here? Another testing question for you, Dev, over to you. So acknowledgement, is a magical thing and i hear you a lot of times we feel like we're not acknowledged for what we do we feel unfulfilled you know even at home you know i remember growing up and sometimes i might have he heard my mom saying well oh like you know being in the house and doing all of this housework is is a thankless job so but the moment that she got acknowledged she felt very different you know it, it inspired her she felt like you know like all of the hard work she put in was appreciated. Now, when I talk about acknowledgement in the model, we, I did say about you know, the two sides, right? acknowledging the facts of something and then using it as, as, as gratitude, for example. And a lot of times people are busy at work, for example, and you don't really get acknowledged. And what I tell people is like, be 100% responsible for the way things are around you. If there's acknowledgement that you haven't received, go ask for it. Again, you're being 100% responsible for ensuring that you are fully acknowledged for the contribution you made to the company, for example. 
So I always tell people, and I do that all the time. If I did a good job at something or finished a project in time, I request my team to acknowledge me. And then I ask them, like, what would they like to be acknowledged for? So that way we bridge that gap where someone walks away feeling like they've done hard work, but nobody appreciates it. I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Dev. And we have a bonus question. And that question is, how can I see all my concerns and attachments so that I can always be in action? Over to you, Dev. So really great question. How can you see your concerns and attachment? Well, the beginning point of that is this conversation we're having where you can now start seeing, well, hmm, I do have concerns that sort of run the way I do things. And I you know, do have attachments that is, it's where I'm fixated on the way the world is supposed to look, how my life is supposed to look, what kind of job I'm supposed to have, what kind of person I'm supposed to get married to. Now, let me put it to you this way. As long as you are alive, you would have concerns and attachment. And as fast as you see them, you you also create an other concerns and attachment, you know? So it's not like you will always be able to say, oh, well, I've, I have uncovered and discovered all of my concerns and attachment. And therefore, now I could be in action all the time. It doesn't work like that because of the way we are built. You know, our brain is always in survival mode. So we're always looking to survive something. We're always going to create a concern about something. You know, we're always going to have an attachment about something. So this here is what I like to say. You have to be committed to ongoingly be in a mode of discovery, to continuously keep discovering where you might have a concern, where you're operating from a concern, where you're operating from the space of an attachment, right? So it doesn't go away. You just have to be committed to the process all the time. And, you know, when you get into that mode, it's like going to the gym, right? You keep practicing over and over and over. And then eventually you gain some level of mastery with working out. It's the same thing. So now that you've had this conversation, it's like your first time going to the gym. And now where the beauty comes and the, the magic come is in discovering this over and over. Today, you discover some concerns, tomorrow, the next day, the next day. And as you go along, you create them as well. So you have to keep discovering them over and over again. Thank you, Dev, for your insightful responses again. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for those testing questions to Dev and our other presenters. All good things must come to an end. And we have come to the end of what has been a truly wonderful first anniversary celebration virtually for the ACCA Jamaica chapter. I would like to thank those persons who made this function possible, the members of the chapter, the stakeholders and partners who assisted us, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, um, Sixta Coy, president of the ICAJ, um, our parent, um, ACCA Caribbean, Shelly and Mohammed, who is the head of ACCA Caribbean. I'd also like to thank our guest speaker, Dev Ramnarain, for his wonderfully informative presentation, something that we will take with us for the rest of our lives. And I would like to thank you, our audience, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And I would like to share with you something I found recently that I think you might find informative, maybe even amusing. And it's something for chartered accountants. And it is called the balance sheet of life. Birth is your opening stock. What comes to you is credit. What goes from you is debit. Death is your closing stock. Your ideas are your assets. Your bad habits are your liabilities. 
Your happiness is your profit. Your sorrow is your loss. Your soul is your goodwill. Your heart is your fixed assets. Your character is your capital. Your knowledge is your investment. Your age is your depreciation. And finally, always remember, God is your auditor. Have a nice balance sheet of life. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my pleasure to moderate this evening's proceedings. Please stay safe and blessings to you all. Thank you very much.